All right, well, uh, hopefully everybody's having a great meeting so far and uh, have learned lots of great stuff. What we're going to talk about this morning is the digital workflow. And uh, I'm sure no one has noticed as they walk around all the 3D printers and scanners and everything else. So um, obviously when we pick this discussion topic here, uh, we were kind of prescient and knew that all this was going to be here. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit. Dr. Badawi, good morning. You can come up here and give this. You, uh, so traditionally, when we think about the digital workflow in an orthodontic practice, you have some form of scanner, process it through a computer, and send it off to a commercial lab. And then they would do whatever that happens to be that they do, and you would get the product back. <clears throat> and over the course of the last decade, the number of scanners has just proliferated. Uh, so some of them have stayed in the market. Some of them have kind of disappeared because they didn't quite meet the needs of the orthodontist. And these are the two primary scanners that are left in the marketplace that most of us use today. And so I uh, and my staff prefer the three shape, even though we have all of these scanners. Uh, some of them are collecting dust. Some of them we use as, uh, you know, coat hangers um, and different things, but uh, we use a three shape unless we're sending a scan to a line because they you know, require their proprietary stuff. And the reason that we like the three shape is it gives us the most options. And so we've kind of transitioned, and we're going to talk about this as we go along, into doing a lot of things in the office that I never thought were possible. So we start the process with our comb beam. Right, we have an iCat. I actually have one in each office. And so that, this gives us our initial 3D data that we then have many, many options about what we can do with it. So the nice thing about the comb beam is that all this is captured in one image. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, the radiation exposure on these x-rays is about the same as a pan and SF. Depending on which model you have, it could be like one or two units more or less than, than the pan and stuff. And so it's not any more radiation than the traditional uh, orthodontic series that we would use. But you can send this off to anatomage and actually use it to help plan treatment. So if you have a patient that you're not quite sure, or the, the uh, patient's not quite sure of what you're presenting to them, you can send this off. And uh, anatomage will process things like this, and then you can present it to the patient. The other thing that you can do, and you can do this right now, is you can marry the comb beam to that scan. So my patients come in now, they get an intraoral scan, we get, still get the photos, although we're getting to the point where we're going to eliminate the intraoral photos, and then they get the comb beam. And you can marry these two together this quickly, and then what you have is married to the roots of the teeth for treatment planning purposes. And so our ability to have basically the virtual patient right in front of us is available right now. This is not futuristic or anything else. We have all the processing we need right here at the meeting. And this is how quick and simple it is to marry those two together. Hisham, you can remember when we first started talking about this a decade ago, we were like, oh, that's really hard. It's going to take forever. And, and this is like video of the computer screen happening this quickly. And you're going to see it in just a second where it just snaps together. So um, you don't have to be an expert. You just match the points. My staff does it for me if I, if I need to have it done. And before you know it, there you have the comb beam married to the, the scan, you have perfectly accurate 3D data. So it's almost like magic in the office. The other thing that we can do is maximize the experience of the patient by minimizing the treatment times. And we can use all our digital data to help do that. So one of the things that we do in my office is we do sagittal first treatment. And we do that so that the patient then has an option after we've corrected the AP problem, they can either go to aligners or brackets. And those things are interchangeable. And we have the data set 
to be able to go directly one way or the other, or even combine the two pretty readily. Now that we have other uh, options for aligners, we can use our intraoral scanner to have aligners manufactured. Uh, if you notice that we now have SLX clear aligners here uh, at Henry Schein. And the nice thing about these aligners, as opposed to the ones that we've all been using, is they are crystal clear. Because of the manufacturing process, there's no striations and there's no attachments. And so when the patients are wearing them, you cannot see them in the mouth. Matter of fact, a couple of the uh, folks here in the booth are wearing them, and my guess is you've already talked to them and didn't even know that they were wearing these aligners. So it's a nice option to be able to have. The other thing that you can do with that data set, if they elect to go with braces, is you can do the setup and now have indirect bonding. And so the indirect bonding methods that we use are, are somewhat uh, variable, if, if that's the right phrase. Depending on the company that you use, sometimes you'll put the brackets on the models and then they will print out the models with those brackets and you'll make your uh, indirect bonding tray and then seat the brackets in there. Sometimes the model will be the setup and then you have to put the brackets on there and make the uh, bonding tray in a more traditional manner. So you can, for instance, send off to Elmetrix. They will do the setup, design the jigs virtually, and then send you back the data set so you can print that jig in your office or they can print it for you if you don't have a 3D printer. 3Shape will do the setup and prepare the model that has uh, the brackets on it, in which case you can either direct print the, uh, the, the precision tray and put the um, brackets in there, or you'll know where the brackets go and you can do the traditional type of uh, indirect bonding tray, which is what ARCAD does. So ARCAD, you do the setup and everything else, and then they take the brackets on there that you use and will make the traditional indirect bonding tray and send it to you. Now, currently, I don't use any of these, and the reason is that I'm waiting to be able to do the setup myself in my office, send it directly to my printer, and be ready to do a same-day start. So the only heartache that I have with the current indirect bonding models is the time lag between the exam and when we're ready to start the patient. And so same day starts are very important in my office as far as uh, predictability of patients getting rolling. With the SLX brackets, we can use the uh, uh, setup on a three shape, and this is what it looks like. You can manipulate the teeth any direction you want with the brackets, and so, um, it avoids a lot of the chair time in doing this. And all this is available currently. So uh, the process of getting rolling is, is actually quite simple. Once you have all this data, then you have to do something with it. So as I said at the beginning, traditionally, we would have gone to commercial 3D printers, right? And as we all know, commercial 3D printers are very, very expensive. And unless you have a huge group uh, as a practice, you're not gonna buy one of these. It just doesn't make any sense financially. There are a zillion now hobby printers that you can buy, right? Go to Best Buy and get any one of these. And the problem is that the materials that they have don't meet the needs for precision that we have as orthodontists. And so people have tried using them, but I promise you it's really a waste of time and money to do that. You can put one out in the front desk of your office and have it print little toys as an entertainment for uh, kids to come in, but not for what we're gonna do. So then if you do get a 3D printer in your office, what are you gonna do with it? You're gonna make Essex retainers? You're gonna do other things? That's a decision that has to be made. So the current printers that are really applicable to uh, orthodontics are the Form 2, which we have here in the booth, 
The Forum 2 is nice because it's very inexpensive, all right? It's not quite as fast as some of the more expensive printers, but they have a variety of resins that you can use. The Jewel Flash is another uh, popular printer. It's much faster and has a bigger uh, platform. And then the Envision Tech is expensive as well, and they have a variety of FDA-approved materials to do different things. So I currently have a Form Labs and an Envision Tech, and the one thing that you need to realize is that the cost of the printer in the long run is like the color printer in your office. If something goes wrong with it, you don't even fiddle with it to try and fix it, right? You throw it out and then go to Best Buy and get another printer because the ink costs more than the printer. And in the long run, you know, half the time these stores are essentially giving the printers away because they know you're going to buy the ink over and over and over again. This is the same thing. My guess is five years from now, we're going to be on a subscription service to get the resins, and they're just going to give us the printers. Because the resins in the long run is what the expense is. And so Scott Fry wrote this nice uh, analysis on uh, OrthoCosmos blog on how much it costs to run various printers. He also did a really unique study um, because all the, the printer companies claim that their printer is more accurate than the other printer and all this other stuff. So what we did was kind of interesting. We each took the same STL scan file and emailed it around to various and sundry people who had different printers. And then we printed that model on our printers in the office rather than getting them from the companies. And Scott collected all those models and sent them to a company in Austria who then did an accuracy analysis and compared it to the original STL. And it turns out they're all about the same, right? So those three printers all fit within the, uh, the practicality of what we need for accuracy in an orthodontic office. So don't let some salesperson tell you this is more accurate than the other one. They're basically vanilla when it comes to that. All right, so how do they work? Well, the, uh, there's three different types. Um, the Form Labs is a stereolithography printer, which means it uses a laser, and that laser bounces off mirrors and follows the outline of whatever it's printing in the resin. And as the resin gets cured by that laser, it gradually comes up, and that's why you see those striations on the model as it prints, all right? And so it's drawing an outline and curing the resin as it goes. The other types of printers, uh, the Jewel Flash and the Envision Tech are DLP, and what that means is that just like the video projector you have in your house if you have a home theater, it projects the whole image at one time, and that's why it's a flash, right, rather than outlining it with a laser. There's advantages and disadvantages to both types. Um, the laser tends to be more accurate on the periphery because you don't get uh, visual distortion as you go to the edges, but there's more moving parts, so they tend to break more readily, right? So there's a balance of, of what you're gonna do. And the speed difference is because of the laser having to trace all those outlines versus just boom, 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 right? So for most of us, we'll have more than one printer because once you get used to it, you need redundancy. Um, this is what it looks like with a fully loaded print tray. Now, what happens if we're in the middle of printing this and all of a sudden you have a mom comes in that really, really, really needs the retainer because they're going off to camp? You go, well, I'm sorry, the printer's busy right now and we don't know how to do it that other way anymore. So you're gonna have to come back tomorrow, I'm sorry. That just doesn't fly, right? So um, it, we had our first printer for probably a month before we realized we needed a second one. And now the tendency is to actually have a print farm, right? So the print farm works in that you have all these printers and the native software will pick which one's empty and just launch the job to that printer. And so you're never out of business. And there's actually an orthodontist in Hawaii, Sean Holiday, who has a print farm set up like this. And so he has these things going 24 hours a day. So rather than having one really, really fast printer, he's got a whole stack of them. And if one breaks down, because the form labs are so inexpensive, 
he literally just tosses that one aside, puts another one, you know, into the line, and away they go. So there's two different thought processes, and you have to see how the uh, logistics in your office work to decide which is going to be the best process for you. But I can promise you, if you have one, you will need two. It's just the, the nature of the beast. This is what the models look like when they come out. And so uh, you can't use them when they come out of the resin. Right? So there's a thing called post-processing. And that post-processing involves washing the excess resin off with ethanol. Uh, Form Labs actually has this really cool ethanol bath that vibrates and everything to get things cleaned up faster. And then they have to go in a post-cure oven, which is primarily ultraviolet light. It cures any uncured resin, and some of the ovens um, have a little heat involved as well, which speeds up that process. But you have to go through the post-cure in order to use the models, otherwise they just kind of fall apart. Right? So that process is in addition to the print time. And so when you're looking at the total processing time, um, even if the print time is, say, 20 minutes, you've got another 15 or 20 minutes on the other side before your lab can actually use the models. All right? What about the next generation of printing? So this has been done at MIT now for at least three years, and this video is going to show you a thing called 4D printing, which is really cool. What this guy did is realize that you can take a, a, geograph, a, a geometric form right, that has certain characteristics, print the 3D image with these predetermined geometric forms, and if you imbue energy into it, which can be heat, vibration, um, electricity, any form of energy into these three-dimensional forms, they change their form after that energy is put in. Now, I show you this because what do we do as orthodontists? We put energy into an appliance and then it is applied as force to the tooth. So I can easily imagine, uh, imagine something like this where we would have, say, one aligner that is built in the manner of 4D printing that then, as the teeth move, would generate different forces if we, say, apply vibration or heat or whatever to it and have that all engineered at the beginning. And what we would be doing is prescribing when and how much energy needed to be applied as opposed to changing the appliance as we go along. So that's just a fantasy right now, but I certainly believe it can happen because this has been around for three years and who knows what they've done at MIT since this video came out. So what you're gonna see is he puts this in the hot water and it forms his initials, right? That's how easy it is. So just keep that in the back of your mind. If you hear these sorts of things in the future, it isn't as fantastical as it might seem. What if we can eliminate a couple of appointments, right? So our finishing process now is an active process. Um, We've managed to eliminate an arch wire change. We've shortened down the inner uh, uh, appointment intervals. And so patients now routinely in my office are finishing in 10 months of fixed appliances or less. And we think we can get it down to eight months routinely. We've just started doing this. So imagine at that appointment where you do the artistic detailing bends, which is what we do now, right down on the lab ship where all those bends are, do a pre-debond scan, then you remove the brackets from the, the teeth virtually, mimic those bends in the virtual interface on the computer, and then pre-build the retainers at the end target. And I'm gonna show you how that works. So we go through this process, and this is gonna show you how easy it is with the orthoanalyzer software to remove the brackets. So this is the scan with the brackets on, and you're gonna see that they simply outline the bracket, and the next thing we know, uh, that bracket is just gonna disappear and the virtual tooth surface is gonna be there. And it doesn't take any longer to this. So uh, my lab does all this for me, I don't do it. Um, I actually, when we got the 3D printer, uh, I had a staff meeting and said, well, someone's gonna have to learn how to do this. 
And uh, I had a gal that was working in sterilization that said, well, it looks kind of cool. Can I try it? And so now she has become like our digital expert. And she knew nothing about it 18 months ago. And that's all she does now. So now that model is cleared up. And now we can go on to the next step, which is to move the teeth. So after all the brackets are removed, then they go in and digitally segment the arch. And as they segment the arch, that makes each of these teeth individually movable. So I can then go on to the computer screen, which you'll see in a second, and move the teeth. And so we do the scan and five minutes later, this is waiting for me out in the clinic. And so now all I do is go in, you can see where the brackets were. If you go to the sepia tone, you can't see those. But if you go to the full color mode, it leaves the, the virtual pad on there, even though the tooth is smooth. And so I'll go in and tweak any little things that I did in that final arch wire adjustment and match it. And then I can even do anything else that I might have missed clinically, because you get the teeth really big. And then we might make, instead of one retainer, if there's additional movements, we might make a series of two or three. Now the nice thing is that the models never break. And so at D-Bond, we clean things up, they get their retainers, and we always give them two. So one of them is in the little bag, you know, they get the retainer case, take home, and then they also get this model with a second retainer on it. And we always tell the parents, you know, if they lose or break their retainer, it's not a big deal. they got a spare. Take good care of it. And if they use the spare, just drop the model off, and we can make you another one, because the plastic only costs a dollar. So these models are indestructible. So it's like they're gold. And you know, it's such a stress reliever for the mom to know she doesn't have to worry about Johnny or Susie losing their retainers. And we'll just have them drop them off and then come back when it's convenient to uh, give it back to them. And that way they've always got a running spare at home without us having to do anything else. So once you're finished treatment, you can take this digital data and actually compare what you did, right? So this is using an anatomage. All you have to do is virtually superimpose the before and after cone beams. This photo is just the straight facial photo wrapped onto the cone beam. And in this case, I had um, anatomage go in and segment out each individual tooth for me and map the movements start to finish, all right? But you can do the superimposition yourself in your office, you just can't do the video play. What that does is gives a true, accurate representation of what happened. Because you superimpose it on cranial base, voxel by voxel. So it's not a guess. It's not like trying to trace cefts and compare things. This is actual physical model of what the patient is, and you can't fake it. So that's all the stuff that we can do with digital orthodontics now. And I mean, it's the most exciting time I've ever been in practice. It's just so much fun. But you gotta be prepared for the changes and redundancy. That's the key. Because once you get into it, you gotta have more than one scanner, more than one printer, and all that sort of thing. So, any questions? All right, thank you.